name is Polly Reynolds. I'm the head of adult services and archives here at the library. Um, we put on programs all throughout the year, almost every day, sometimes three times a day. Um, everything from authors to music to business. Um, grab one of these brochures. Um, they're at that front table so you can see what upcoming author events we have going on. Um, Following tonight's presentation, there'll be a reception and a book signing in the library rotunda. You'll just exit this room if you've been to one of these programs before and just go back into the library and head straight and you'll kind of see everyone lining up. You'll get to meet the author, get your book signed. There'll be cookies and coffee. So please, please join us for that. It's always a great time. I'm truly honored to introduce tonight's speaker, Claire McMillan. She's the author of The Necklace and Gilded Age, which was inspired by Edith Worth Wharton's House of Mirth. She is the 2017-2018 Cuyahoga County Writer in Residence and currently serves as a member of the Board of Trustees of The Mount, Edith Wharton's home in Lenox, Massachusetts. She practiced law until 2003 and then received her MFA in Creative Writing from Bennington College. She grew up in Pasadena, California, and now lives on her husband's family farm outside of Cleveland, Ohio, with their two children. Please join me in welcoming Claire McMillan. Thank you, Polly, for that uh, nice introduction. Hi, everyone. Um, I am your neighbor because I live uh, in Mentor near Sharp. So that's where I came from tonight. Um, but I thought I'd talk a little bit tonight um, about the necklace and about some of the inspirations for my writing, because a lot of them come from around here, and um, you guys might, I don't know, be familiar with some of them. So uh, the necklace is, just to fill you in a little bit, is um, a novel. It takes place half in the 1920s in Cleveland when, as you know, Cleveland was a boom town, and half in present day um, Cleveland. And it follows a family named the Quincy's. And you first meet the Quincy's um, in modern day, where they're just kind of a normal family, um, like a lot of families. There are issues and secrets, but um, you know, they're pretty normal. But uh, 100 years ago in 1920, um, they were, um, you know, sons and daughters of robber barons, and there was huge industrial wealth. And one of the things I was interested um, in exploring in the necklace was what is it like um, to be in a family like that? But not only that, what is it like 100 years later when everybody's just kind of normal? Um, and what is the hangover from that kind of wealth like? So those are some of the kind of general themes of the book, and um, I'll read a little bit from it at the end. But um, one of the major inspirations for the book is the farm that I live on. Um, it's called Mountain Glen Farm. It was built by my husband's great-grandfather in 1921. And it was built um, as a gentleman's party house, basically. I say they didn't, build, they didn't farm anything there except for my husband's family, basically. Um, and uh, we moved in in 2006. We inherited it from his grandparents. Um, his parents, my in-laws, looked at the size of the project, <laughs> looked at their house, which is beautiful, that they had built, and they said, you know, this is a young person's game. And, uh, my, and also, my husband always wanted to live there his whole life. And so they very graciously set, stepped aside, and we moved in um, in 2006. So as you can imagine, um, it was quite a clean out. Uh, Sandy's grandmother was a depression baby. Um, she was 18 in 1929 when the stock market crashed. It affected her, her family greatly. And because of that, um, I think a lot of us have members of our family who are maybe a little bit like that, who had gigantic balls of um, tinfoil and twine and every single uh, Christmas letter, uh, Christmas card they'd ever received and these sorts of things. So the house was packed. And uh, my mother and I went through it. It took a long time. It took three 40-yard um, contractor dumpsters um, and also you know goodwill and n never fear we tried to save what we could save um, and people took what they wanted and all that stuff but one of the things that had always been in the house was a scrapbook that Sandy um, my husband Sandy's great-grandmother kept of the year the house was built um, and this is the cover of the scrapbook it's about this big um, and it's a leather, it's beautiful, it's painted, and she kept it of all the house parties that they threw in the house. 
Um, and so this is one of the pictures in the scrapbook. Um, on the top there, oh look, on the top there is um, Sandy's great grandmother. Um, and down here, of course, are um, all the guys in their black woolen bathing suits that look like they'll like sink you to the bottom of the uh, swimming pool. So it was really interesting to me, the scrapbook. I was immediately fascinated with it because my view of the 1920s was really, um, uh, in, you know, kind of impacted by this view of the Great Gatsby, maybe, or Hemingway, or maybe, you know, Paris, New York, um, the uh, the flappers, um, all these sorts of things. So I viewed the 20s as this very kind of metropolitan, um, very glamorous time. And it was glamorous in in this country house in Cleveland, but there was also a whole lot of like make fun kind of because they're in Cleveland. If you can see, this is a man in drag here. Um, I don't know what he's doing, but they're doing, you know, some kind of, uh, I'm going to take this, some kind of costume party or something. And um, Basically, you know, they're out in the country in Cleveland, outside Cleveland. So they had to, like, make fun for themselves. Um, this is a, a couple, you know, in costume again. There was um, these, like, horse races where they would, you'd get on your horse and you'd ride across the field where your partner was. And then you'd get off your horse and you'd smoke a cigarette and drink a cocktail and get back on your horse and go to the other side. Um, so, you know, it was very glamorous, but it was also very country in a way. And you can see what I love here in this picture. This is Sandy's great grandmother, I think. And you can see she still has the Gibson girl kind of bun in her hair. But you can see other members of the party, I think, have bobbed their hair already. So you can see that kind of influence of the 1920s and Cleveland. Um, it was interesting, I was talking to a historian, I said, would Cleveland have lagged behind the times in, in terms of style um, in the 1920s? And he said, oh no. He said they were right there with the rest of the world because they were such a major, major city with so much money. And, um, and all, the, all the kind of women of wealth went to Paris and, and got their clothes made there. Um, so that was a big inspiration for me, the scrapbook. Another thing that was a big inspiration for me was um, the Sandys related distantly to Amasa Stone Mather. So if you know Amasa Stone Chapel at Case Western Reserve University, so he, this, this Amasa Stone was named after that Amasa. Um, in honor of him. So he was, he's related to Sandy and he, um, took a trip around the world in 1907 as sons of um, you know, wealth sometimes did on one of these grand tours. And he went all through Asia and all through Africa and he, he um, shot hundreds of animals and like left them to rot. It was horrible. <laughs> but that's what you did back then. And he, um, he died very young. He died in 1920 of 21 of influenza and he was quite young when he died and he was view he's viewed in Sandy's family as kind of a golden child um, you know he was viewed as someone who was very smart and and very um, had a lot of joie de vivre and kind of this um, notion of a person in your family who's who's a lot wasted potential I think a lot of families have that when somebody dies too young um, so because of this, uh, you know, his father, when he died, was so bereft that he had all of his um, letters and notebooks and diaries from his trip around the world bound in these beautiful leather um, books, and he gave them out at the funeral. And one of them was in our house, so I thought, okay, um, I'm, I'm going to, like, read this because, you know, he's viewed as this golden, this golden person. So as I started to read it, um, and here, this is Amasa right here with his buddies, um, and one of them died on the trip of typhoid, and there are all the letters about that and everything. Um, but as I read it, you know, I really started to understand the mystique of him. Um, his letters are very evocative, they're very romantic, he wrote poetry, um, and he did have a real zest for life, like a take a bite out of life kind of guy. And, um, so I kind of fell a little bit in love with him myself, and I kind of understood it, and I wanted to base a character um, on him. So if you've read the book, the character of Ambrose Quincy is, is based loosely inspired um, on Amasa. 
And it was funny, as I, there are two volumes. As I got about halfway through the second volume, I had to go get a butter knife out of the kitchen because it's an old kind of book where you have to cut the pages. And I was the first one to cut those pages. So I was, a, I was like, nobody in your family's read this. Like, I'm the first one cutting these pages. But anyway, so that's Amsa. And so he, he uh, served as inspiration as well. Um, and one of, the, one of the other inspirations for me as well was um, in 2001, this is Sandy, uh, we, Sandy and I went and lived in India. We lived in New Delhi for nine months. Um, he was sent there, he worked for Boston Consulting Group, and he was sent there um, on a large assignment. And I was working at the time as a lawyer. I was very unhappy. So I went to my firm. I said, could I take a sabbatical? They said, you're a third year lawyer. You didn't take a sabbatical? And I didn't really care. I was like, fire me. And they were like, OK, well, will I take a sabbatical? So I was kind of lucky. Anyway, I loved India. I fell in love with it. Um, I enjoyed it so much. This is us on Christmas Day. Um, and I ran around in, this is a salwar kameez. I ran around in a salwar kameez all nine months. Sandy's in a kurta pajama, and I think that's the last time he wore that. <laughs> um, but we just, I enjoyed it so much. I loved the people. I loved, um, obviously, the textiles. But what I really fell in love with was um, the jewelry. So the, um, this is Maharaja Bhupinder Singh. Um, he, he, like a lot of Maharajas, you know, they wear tons and tons of jewelry. And I would travel especially through North India and Rajasthan. And um, you would go to these big palace hotels. It's, it's a bit similar to England in that a lot of the royal families there are either open their house up for tours, or you can actually stay in the house. And there would always be a portrait of kind of, you know, the ancestor and his splendor. And I came to understand that um, some, whoops, sorry, some of these um, jewels were missing. And I was like, they're missing, like how, like grandfather's gigantic, you know, diamonds are missing. Um, and I came to um, understand that during partition in 1947, when India and Pakistan were created and the Raj pulled out of India, that a lot of times jewels were either looted or stolen, or the Maharajas took the um, advantage of the chaos of the time to quietly sell off some of their jewelry and um, make some money. So one of the most fascinating kind of tales of um, this was the Patiala necklace. It was owned by Bhupinder Singh. This is a picture of it. And this here is the seventh largest diamond in the world. It's the second largest yellow diamond. So here he is wearing it. Um, and during partition, this whole thing just went missing. Like the seventh largest diamond in the world was just like gone. No one knew where it was. And then in the mid 80s um, in Geneva, Switzerland, just the stone turned up at auction. Um, and clearly, whoever was selling it had good provenance um, to, you know, to satisfy Christie's or whoever. And it was bought by the De Beers Corporation and renamed the De Beers Diamond. So De Beers has that part. And then, um, but that's not the end of the story because. Uh, the, the entire setting was made by Cartier in 1920, actually, for the Maharaja. And there was an artisan from Cartier uh, in the mid-90s who was poking through junk shops off Portobello Road in London. And he came across the setting. Um, most of the big stones had been popped out, but it still had a good number of the diamonds. And he bought it and brought it back to Cartier, and Cartier um, restored it with synthetic diamonds. This is actually, this is a picture of the restored necklace. And it now travels um, around the world to the Cartier boutiques in Hong Kong and Beverly Hills and whatever. So, um, so that, you know, that those stories fascinated me, fascinated me. The Patiala diamond necklace is not the only story like that. Um, and so, you know, if, you take kind of all those things and kind of mush them together. You get the inspiration for the necklace. You have the setting of the house of the farm, and you have a character in Ambrose. You have um, the jewelry. And you know, a final kind of mix in there was my time as a lawyer. Um, I was really fascinated by the idea of um, looted and stolen antiquities and what happens um, in those cases. 
I took a seminar on it in law school, and we spent about all of two minutes, I mean, like a day, on, um, on them. But it's, you know, it's fascinating. In the U.S. here, we have, and around the world, we have very specific laws on Nazi art. We have very specific art laws pertaining to um, different types of art. You know, the CMA just returned um, that big Hanuman statue to Cambodia because there was issues with that. Well, Bill Griswold, the, head, the new head of the museum, he just received the Cleveland um, Arts Prize for his leadership in this area of returning looted and stolen items back to countries and people to whom they belong. But it's a pretty fuzzy area of law because it's in, it involves international law. Um, it's not very set. So a lot of times, um, you know, things are returned or repatriated just through negotiation or through someone like Bill Griswold being very forward thinking. Um, so I was always very fascinated about the mechanisms of that. And then also in law school, you take a wills and estates and trust um, case. And so I have a number of inheritance issues that um, turn the plot in the necklace as well. And I had a dear friend who um, practices in that area of estate planning. So I'd send her these complicated emails um, saying, what if this and what if that? And she'd be like, I feel like I'm back in law school with all this hypos, you know, in, in law school, the hypotheticals. But, um, but yeah, you know, that's, those are a bit of the inspirations for the necklace. Um, another thing I thought I'd, I'd talk just a little bit about tonight in terms of inspiration is the inspirations behind my first book, Gilded Age. Um, so Gilded Age, you know, as mentioned, is a retelling of Edith Wharton's House of Mirth. Edith is my, f I call her Edith. Edith is my favorite writer. Um, if you haven't read House of Mirth in a while, it involves a gold digger in 1905 in New York City in society and kind of the, you know, what happens to her. And uh, Gilded Age, I updated it for, you know, 2000. 12 when it came out and set it in Cleveland. So um, if you read it, you certainly recognize some of the settings. Um, but when it first came out, the Mount invited me to come um, visit Edith's house, the Mount. So yeah, right? I heard someone go, oh, yeah. So this, <laughs> this is the Mount. It's in Lenox, Mass. It's open to the public. Uh, you can tour it. Um, she designed it with her friend Ogden Codman and um, and uh, and lived there from 1905 to about 1912. And then she lived in France for the rest of her life. But when you first arrive, it's really interesting. The um, style of the house is the piano nobile style from Italy. So when you walk in, this is the front entry hall. And it's really only this area that you can walk into. This is like... Um, so this is like service areas and kitchen. So you just walk in here and you're in an entry hall and then you have to go up. And when you go up, um, these are the public rooms. And then up here are the bedrooms. And Edith's bedroom is here on the other side of the house. So to me, as a writer, when I arrived, I was fascinated by this because as a writer, you know, what we need to do our work is solitude and privacy, and she basically engineered her entire house, right, so that when you arrive, she's as, she wrote in her bedroom, she's as far away from you as she can possibly get. And she also kind of created like an extra layer of privacy in her house, like, because you have to go in the house, um, but then you have to, you have to go up. So um, the Mount is a fascinating place to, for, for me. This is the long hall on the front of the house, um, so if you're here in the front, that's what it looks like. Um, it's quite beautiful. This is her dining room. Um, if some of you know the famous interior decorator, Bunny Williams, she, yeah, you guys are nodding your head. So she um, uh, was commissioned, basically volunteered for the Mount to help redo some of the interiors. They don't have use furniture so Bunny got together with some of her buddies and each of them took a different room and decorated it in an updated Edith style so Edith always had a um, circular table for dinner and you can't see it but they put little dog beds here because this is Edith's place and she always had little dogs um, with her even at dinner 
Um, and this is her library. So they don't have her furniture, but they do have all of her books. Um, I was just talking about this beforehand. And um, being in her library is really just a tremendous experience. Um, her collection of books, you know, has a lot of marginalia, her notes. Uh, she read in five languages. And uh, here she is. This is a publicity photo for House of Mirth taken in 1905 in her library. Um, she never wrote in her library, though. She wrote, oh, whoops, sorry. She wrote upstairs in her bedroom. So when my book came out, the Mount said, oh, please, or not, oh, please, they said, would you like to come do reading? I said, yes, I can, I'll go to the airport and be on the next flight in the morning. Um, and it must have gone well, because then they asked me, would you, would you like to be on a panel of people who've been inspired by Edith? So they had me, and then they had a, the visual artist, uh, Daniel Watterson, and then they had a choreographer who had created an entire ballet based on um, Age of Innocence, which is kind of amazing. So after that, they said, um, OK, so we're starting a writer in residence program because the house is closed during the winter. And we'd like to invite three writers to come and write in the house uh, before we open it to the public in March. We think you should apply. So it's like, of course I'm applying. So um, I luckily got it. And this is a picture of me working on, you can tell I'm a post-it fanatic, working on edits for the necklace. Uh, in Edith Wharton's bedroom. So, yeah, it was so amazing. I'm on a plastic uh, catering table, which is all good for my post-its and everything, but I crammed it, like, right where her bed would be. So she would write every morning in bed longhand, and she would um, drop the pages on the floor, and then her personal secretary, Anna Ballman, who was with her her whole life, would come and, and gather the papers and take them to the other room, type them up for her. So... Um, I didn't have that. I had my laptop, and I had uh, my Nespresso espresso machine um, with me, which was hilarious. I know it was hilarious. They, uh, they, they, the like the groundskeeper and everything. They kept referring to me as the one who brought her coffee machine. Um, but I was like, we're writers, you know, whatever. So anyway, at the end of all this, the director uh, took me out to lunch and said you need to be on the board, like you're a nut. So um, they wanted a, a writer on the board. So um, so it has been my incredible pleasure to be on the board of the Mount for the last three years. Um, and then another thing they did when you're in residence is, is every evening you would come downstairs and they would have dinner for you. <laughs> so this is not how my life is. I'll just say that for two weeks. But um, this was the final dinner and they had invited donors and people they wanted to love up a bit to come in and meet the um, writers. But every, but every evening we'd come down and, and we'd have dinner um, with members of the staff or special people that you know they were trying to involve with the mount or whatever. So it was just, it's a very special place for me. And um, yeah, that just gives you an idea of some of the, some of the um, you know, inspiration behind Gilded Age, my con connection, my crazy connection with Edith, and some of the ins um, inspiration behind the necklace. So I thought I'd just read a, a few pages of the opening pages, and then I'm happy to um, take questions. So. So uh, the book opens with the Quincy's in modern day. And um, I'm just going to read a little bit about our heroine, Nell Quincy, who's returning home to her family pile in Cleveland. <clears throat> Before it all begins, Nell looks up at the arched gables, hesitates at the heavy front door. Everything here is a test. No Quincy, not even a peripheral one, knocks unless she aggressively wants to announce herself. A true Quincy would bound in, secure in her welcome. But Nell creaks open the door and silently slips through like an intruder. Lighted by the wavy, leaded glass windows, a taxidermy antelope head gazes down with hazy glass eyes. An Indian black buck, she thinks someone told her this as a child. The ears show patches as if something's been nibbling them. Bits of fur and fuzz, du dust fuzz the floor beneath it. A time warp feeling settles over Nell like weather. She sneezes. 
Her cousin Pansy looks over from the living room and mouths Gesundheit and then turns back to the small group of women Nell should recognize but doesn't, no doubt in conference over last minute details for Lulu's wake tomorrow. What does one call Quincy's in multiple? A clutch? That's eggs. A murder? That's crows. A judgment? That's perfect. The judgment of Quincy's brings to mind her ancestor, Increase Quincy, and his infamous verdicts at Salem, and makes her wonder if judgment is encoded in the Quincy double helix. She feels an arm around her waist and a kiss on her cheek. Nell Bell, her cousin Emerson, Pansy's younger brother, is Nell's age and adheres to the male Quincy uniform of dark suit and tie. Despite this, he's rumpled. His tie with a pattern of tiny clocks is fraying at the wide end. He smells like he's been here for at least a few old granddads. Hey, she says as she gives his waist an extra squeeze and lets it go that he knows she hates that nickname. She hasn't seen him in years. Then again, a few years is not particularly long between her and the Quincy's. Her parents preferred living in Oregon, where they'd met and where Nell lives now. They put a country between themselves and the Quincy's reflexively sizing them up. Despite this removal, Nell's mother would insist they make a pilgrimage here most summers. She'd instruct Nell for the length of the car ride from the airport to use her best manners, say please and thank you and pass hors d'oeuvres before taking one for yourself. She'd turn fully in her seat, lean over the armrest and inspect Nell's fingernails for dirt while her father drove. A transformation would come over her parents here. Her mother would become brittle, short with everyone, even Nell's father, whom she adored. Her usually witty and erudite father would go silent. They both drink bourbon at lunch, something Nell never saw them do anywhere else. And Aunt Lulu, as her mother called her, would lead everyone into that big dining room Table, into that big dining room for luncheon. She'd seat herself at the head of a table that gleamed with silver and yellowing brocade and proceed to dominate the conversation with the self-assurance of a favorite child who had never been told to shut up. Thanks. <laughs> So I'm happy to take questions. Or, oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. I understand, but the characters, but it was kind of. Well, I'll have to send you. My editor had me um, make a PowerPoint, pre uh, but not a PowerPoint, an um, Excel spreadsheet of everyone's age when they're born and when they die to make sure it all lined up. So if you give me your email, I'll make sure to send that to you. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. What was Nell's name? Mm. Yeah, so I didn't give her one. <laughs> you're right, you're like a very perceptive reader. Yeah, I didn't give her a name precisely because I was working with so many characters and characters' names. Um, it's interesting, in Gilded Age, I did that as well. My narrator remains unnamed. Um, and I thought about it, about naming her, but it just became this awkward thing where I'd be cramming her name into the narrative. So um, as I was thinking about it, I realized that um, one of my f other favorite books, Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier, you never know the narrator's name. So I was like, okay, if du Maurier did it, then I'm, I, like, I have carte blanche now. So clearly I went nuts because I did it in my second book too. So. <laughs> yeah, but you're very perceptive, yeah. Right, so it depends how you count, but um, <laughs> I did, but I would say it took, I mean, straight through when I really had a hold of it, it took me about two years. It took me about a year, more than a year to probably draft, and then I revised it for another maybe nine months or so. Um, 
in that time I sent it to my agent and two trusted readers um, actually right before I went to the mount before I went in residency so all those post-its that you saw and everything I had um, these three copies with three kind of trusted readers insights and um, they had also written me these letters that were just like pots of gold, right? You know, because you've been working on something for so long in your head. So to get a little oxygen in there from people you trust who are saying things like, um, like this character, you know, is not, they'd say things like, you introduce this character, it's not weighted properly because I didn't realize they were going to be a main character. Like, go back and look at that. Or this happens too fast. Or I didn't believe this dialogue. Or whatever. Just places to go back and really look from people I trusted. So um, at the end of that, uh, I gave it to my agent. And I didn't hear anything from her for about a week. And as a writer, you never want to be like that needy, neurotic writer, right? But I'm like slowly dying a million deaths over that week. And so I finally emailed her. I said, hey, what do you what do you think of the revision? She said, oh, it's already at Simon Schuster. It's already at your editor. And I went, ah! So, um, and they have 30 days uh, as part of my contract. They have 30 days with anything I write to make a bid. So, um, and they liked it and bid on it. But, yeah, it was interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the, no, there's not, but there's, that happened quite a bit back then, um, right? There were those um, seam fires, that, that we, and we even have them today that would keep going, you know, and burning underground um, and level whole town. So I was kind of fascinated by that. So there was not an actual one in Sandusky um, where, I, where I put this one, but, um, but there, there were others, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Nell's father is thinking, you know, that the Quincy's are a family who are kind of both attracted, like in the present day, both attracted to glamour and also kind of judgmental of it. So I was trying to make Nell's father be kind of a more glamorous character and show kind of the way the Quincy's maybe would react to that in real time. I mean, my, my, my thought was kind of, you know, that he had been with Nell's mother and, and she had died when Nell was an adult and he kind of, you know, checked out of the Quincy scene a bit. Um, and, and came back, so so yeah, he has a, a small walk on part, but but yeah, yeah. Sorry, we were saying. Um, I'm working on a book right now. I don't think it'll have a Cleveland connection. I have other ideas for Cleveland books, but um, but yeah, for now, I think I've spent a lot of time in Cleveland. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wrote an epilogue that had, like, I'll email that to you, too. I have to email any people. Um, I wrote an epilogue, and everyone in Simon Schuster hated it. And so I cut it. But basically, you know, Nell gets married, and um, I had Baldwin sold the house to, like, um, a distant relation for, like, a dollar. Um, and, you know, I had uh, the Maj was, like, papped in Portofino with Prince Harry. This is before he got married. Um, you know, like I had all these sorts of things in there, and and what they said actually the the actual feedback was I could you know I would have guessed all these things you know you all these things were very clear like the epilogue didn't really add that much so that was why I kind of took their their um, criticism to heart and I wound up cutting it but yeah if you give me your email I'll send it to you. <laughs> Yeah, I tried to do that, too, um, never in a draft that made it. But, you know, I think, I think it would just be 
so sad, like incredible heartache, I think, actually, you know, that um, Ambrose has died and, um, you know, May is then finds out she's pregnant and, yeah, and Ethan dies. I mean, the whole thing's just so incredibly sad and May dies too. So um, I did try and write, like, the funeral scene, Ambrose's funeral scene, um, but it was it was just... Yeah, it was just incredibly heavy and sad and didn't feel like it fit in the book. So, yeah. Yeah, anyone else? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Are you planning to publish a book in other languages? The book, the necklace came out in Italian. Um, I guess an Italian publisher picked it up. That all goes through my publisher, so I don't really know. But I was excited. We went to Florence for um, spring break, and I went in a bookstore and saw it, and I was like, oh, wow, it's real. So that was pretty exciting. Yeah. Uh, what was the state of birth control in the 1900s? Right. I, I actually went to, you know, we have this great resource here, the Dittrich, Medical Museum at Case. So I actually went down there and um, talked to them about it. And there certainly was birth control. I don't know. I imagine, like, there's Downton Abbey fans, right, in here. Do you remember that one where, like, Lady Mary's maid, right, goes and gets birth control? So, I mean, people did. But, yeah, I mean, I think it was um, very clandestine and difficult to to get. So I didn't think it was completely out of the realm of... um, you know, the story that maybe she she wasn't as careful as she could have been. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll be here, so I'm happy to answer more questions. And thank you all for coming out.